law at the University of California at Irvine and I'm the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. I'm currently the independent chair of the board of the Global Network Initiative. Uh, today, for the next hour, we're going to be speaking to, um, frankly, three friends of mine who, um, I mean, that's the least of their uh, accomplishments, right? They are really eminent uh, people in the space of human rights, uh, of online uh, rights, of, um, of the intersection of business and human rights and many, many other things. And um, they are also three members of the Facebook Oversight Board, uh, inaugural members of the board who've been involved for the past year, beginning with the, the training and orientation that they went through last year, through all of the different issues that many of you will be familiar with that they've addressed uh, over the last several months. Uh, and, um, and I'm really just delighted to have them here. This we've designed as a kind of free-flowing conversation. And uh, what, what I'd uh, like to do is ask each of, the, each of our panelists, uh, each of our oversight board members, a, um, the same kind of question to start, and then we'll just drill down into a number of issues uh, after we go for maybe 30, 35 minutes, uh, or actually throughout this time, if you have any questions, please uh, post them. We'll look at them and we'll be able to integrate them into our conversation as well. So, um, so the first question that I want to ask, and I'm going to start with Nigat Dad, and many of you are, are probably familiar with Nigat, uh, who has been coming to RightsCon for probably many, many years, uh, founded the Digital Rights Foundation in Pakistan, and is a well-known human rights defender, uh, highly regarded, really a leader, not just in Pakistan, but around the world on issues of of freedom of expression and other rights online, the intersection of rights and online space. So Nigat, I wanna start with you. And, and the question that I'm gonna ask each of your, your co-panelists uh, and board members as well is, you know, you came into this process uh, of the board with a, um, a real significant amount of knowledge about how the platforms mediate rights and you know, how they serve as either gatekeepers or in a way barriers perhaps uh, to the enjoyment of rights. And going in, I mean, it must have taken quite a bit of thinking about whether you would join. I, I wonder if you have any, if there's been anything surprising and maybe I'll put it this way, what were your expectations about the board going in and what has been surprising, maybe one or two uh, issues or, or simply activities or, or, or decisions that have been surprising to you over the last year? Um, well, thank you so much, David, for uh, having me on a panel and, uh, with such a, you know, kind introduction. Um, I would say that uh, when I was uh, offered to be part of the board, uh, I'll be very honest. I was, uh, you know, I, I took a great amount of time to think about that because of my uh, role as a digital rights activist who have been, you know, like very vocal around uh, tech giants policies, especially when it comes to uh, global South context, our context, uh, different issues that we have been facing um, in our countries. Um, but at the same time, I, I think I was also, you know, like tired of, you know, uh, uh, pushing the companies to make changes in their policies or, you know, do, do more about uh, the issues that we have been raising from our part of the world. And, uh, and I was like, why not, you know, I should become part of the uh, uh, space where I also have a power to make decisions. And I think that's most of the time, you know, I as an activist in Pakistan, like we fight for such kind of spaces. Um, although there, there was a, you know, con, like considerable, con, considerable amount of discussion. Uh, I mean, I was also worried about my own, you know, like work that I have done over the past few years, several years and was worried that what if it doesn't, you know, turn out the way I'm thinking? Uh, but I would say that uh, since I joined the board, there uh, has been a huge amount of work that has gone into making this board as an institution. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, my co-panelists co will agree to this because uh, 
the kind the kind of labor we are putting into this uh, sort of experiment of self regulation successful i think that's that's just uh, that's a huge amount of work and the one thing that you asked me that's surprising for me uh, this is not a traditional board it's like you know it's an institution that is that is in the making so uh, i'll end here and then yeah over to you great you got i mean that's that's really interesting and i i think it's especially interesting for for your kind of pivot and and the the um, the interest that you perceived in moving from or being part of decision making, um, not just advocacy. I think that's really interesting. And I want to ask Mina Kiai and um, Mina, who's a dear friend and former colleague. Uh, I love being on a on a panel with Mina because people would sort of mix up our our names. Um, uh, we're like, you know, brothers from another mother kind of thing. Um, Mina, who is a, like, like Nigat in Pakistan, Mina is one of the leading human rights defenders uh, in Kenya, uh, served as the first chair of the Kenyan uh, human, uh, or executive director of the, exe of the Kenyan Human Rights Commission and was special rapporteur for the UN on freedom of uh, peaceful assembly and association. Mina, I want to ask you a similar question that I asked uh, of Nigat. And given that you come from the kind of a kind of similar space, speaking truth to power in your entire career, what what were what were your expectations going in, and and how have you been surprised, if, if at all? Thank you, David, and, and it's really good to see the rest of, of my colleagues uh, who 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 we only meet on 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 internet. We've never actually met uh, in person, sadly. So. I think one of my surprises is that we have gone this far without without actually shaking hands and and uh, and looking at people's eye to eye and seeing whether they have as many wrinkles as I have. So so that's been part of the uh, the, the surprises that this has gone on 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 online as of, you know for so long. And I hope we can be able to get offline for a bit and be able to understand each other better. My <clears throat> just like Nigat, I mean, I was first of all I was totally shocked when I was asked to. To be on this board, I just even know I didn't even know where the idea came from. I hadn't I had had a very healthy disregard of Facebook and arm's length relationship with them. I was critical of Facebook in, in, in public. I frankly don't I didn't like the company, and I don't like the company. I'll say keep saying I haven't changed my mind about that. I think it's a very dangerous uh, enterprise in very many ways. It's too big, it's too rich, it's too powerful, and it's a corporate, you know. And so, and I have this view right now that that one of the big dangers of our world is is we've got to have corporate regulation. We've got to be, we've got to move away. We've got to have some more ways of putting the, the inequalities that are going on are just too much. And too much money and too much power is in too few hands. And that's always dangerous from a human rights lens. So I was kind of surprised when I was asked anyway. So going back and forth, and, I, and I, I, when I was eventually, I decided to say yes, because it's an experiment and I, and I want to see if it works. And it's one thing to keep, uh, to keep attacking and criticizing. Another thing to be told, okay, so you, you try and fix it, try and be a player in fixing it. And I, so I see the role very much as that of an internal auditor, internal financial auditor. And then the state and the people are, all, are the external auditors. It's not, the two do not go, are not, are not in contradistinction. So I, I, might, I find that very interesting. I think very, very important. I hope this is an experiment that works. We still don't quite show it will. I hope it works and it's, it's expanded. But there's got to be some form of regulating and and ensuring that human rights are protected from from these big platforms, they are the they are the future of the world. They've got to we've got to find a way to live with them in some form that makes sense to us and keeps us safe, as well as giving us the platform and the voice that we can have. I think the major surprises, I think, for me were, were well, first of all, how complex how complex the decisions are. Sometimes you look at something from the outside and think, oh, this is very simple. You know, of course this should be it should be stay on. Oh, of course this should go down. But actually, it's a bit more complex than that as you go into it and you look into context and other stuff of it. It's a bit, bit more complex. That that I think was was quite uh, was quite uh, surprising, um, and and that's been interesting. That that you've got to take this you've got to take this quite seriously and go slowly through the decision making processes. I think the other the other surprise was was that would be that was was the the constant or maybe not constant but the occasional rise of first amendment versus international human rights law and which one goes where and you know the americans and their first amendment and I, yesterday i'm sure you have seen that article about the aclu and whether the aclu has has lost it in the new york times has lost its 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 uh, its, gra its center of gravity by moving into progressive issues as opposed to being 
for firmly First Amendment. Your right is, is your right. And that there's a big inter interesting debate that goes on between in the human rights world. I think we got uh, kind of paused right there. Um, so what, what I move, I, I'm sorry if you, I don't know if you can hear me or not. That was really fascinating and actually you covered like three quarters of the questions that I was planning to ask, but that's okay. We'll Should drill we down into them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the last thing is, yeah. is that, you know, when you work together in a panel, yeah. you find that whenever you work together in a panel, you find that uh, you, you have to, the compromise, the amount of compromises you have to make has been very interesting. Let's see. That's fantastic. Um, and Mina, sorry if I, if it seemed like I interrupted you, we lost you there for, for a second. Um, so, I want to I want to sort of take from uh, from your comment and move to Evelyn. Now, Evelyn, I think anybody who does work in uh, in human rights and digital space knows the work of Evelyn Oswad, who's written extensively on human rights, on online rights. Uh, started her career in international law as a lawyer at the U.S. State Department. Is now a professor of law at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and has done many, many other things, is really one of uh, the leading American scholars uh, and commentators on, on international human rights. And Evelyn, I, I wanna ask, it's, it's sort of a variation on the question of expectations and surprise, but maybe I could frame it in a way taking off from what Mina was suggesting about the nature of the discussions around, you know, sort of the complexity issue and the First Amendment human rights kinds of issues. And I wonder if, as you were going in to the board to taking on this role, what were your expectations? Maybe put another way, what, what were you hoping to accomplish uh, by joining? And, and also on the, for the surprise kind of question, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the way that you have tried, which I imagine you've tried to do, I don't have any inside knowledge here, um, which is to, to really educate others who aren't necessarily human rights defenders or lawyers or scholars about how human rights uh, should operate in this space. So if those two sort of the, the expectation and then you know, how you've actually worked to integrate human rights in this, um, in this uh, as Mina put it, experiment. Yeah, well, thanks David and thank you for moderating the panel. And of course, thanks to RightsCon for another wonderful uh, week of, of, of talks. Um, yeah, I was pretty open, um, you know, before joining the board about what I would hope it would do. And, and that was that it would um, take the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, a framework for how uh, companies should respect human rights and their operations, that it would really espouse that framework and, and implement it in its day-to-day -day work, which you know, draws a lot, quite frankly, on, on your great work as a special rapporteur in terms of how to, private uh, companies can moderate contact while respecting uh, the scope of international human rights protections for freedom of speech and other rights. Um, so that was, that was my hope. And that was what I was writing to um, when they had consultations um, before launching the board. I, I wrote about these issues to Facebook um, and I wrote articles about this. And, um, and you know, I didn't, I didn't know if it would happen. Uh, I felt for years, a, a bunch of us were going to conferences waving the human rights law flag and not getting too much traction. Um, and I've, I've been uh, happy. Uh, it's been good to see that there has been an espousal um, of this framework and this um, these standards, uh, these UN standards by the board. And I think if folks look at our decisions, you know, they'll see that we're quite rigorous in explaining how we see ourselves within that framework as a grievance mechanism and how we apply those UN standards in each case. Uh, and we try to be very detailed about that. Um, I, I have been a bit of, I would say, um, someone who tries to give the background explanation as, you've, as you mentioned in your question, um, just to share um, uh, some of the research I've been doing in terms of um, freedom of expression norms at the UN. And um, you know, there's obviously the UN Human Rights Committee has a lot of guidance. You've issued a lot of guidance when you were the special rapporteur. Now we have a new rapporteur also issuing uh, guidance. And I think there's, there's actually a lot out there to guide us. And we are trying to um, 
to you know filter it and and apply it as best we can and and I hope that um, um, that I'm able to play a role in, in that process. And I would also um, give great kudos to our, our staff, um, which does tremendous uh, research uh, also to help um, us in this, in this uh, mandate of applying human rights standards to our work. Great, Evelyn, thanks so much. I, I wanna stick with you for, for a sort of a follow on there. And, you know, one of the, uh, sort of results of the debate around content moderation and the, the kind of high profile over the last six months, at least, that human rights has gained you know, in part, in large part, because of the, the work that the three of you are doing with the oversight board. What kind of pushback do you see? Because, you know, the, in, in scholarly settings, in, in panels, you know, there's quite a bit of argument around like, does human rights actually provide appropriate guidance? Does it provide enough? Is it rich enough? Mina described complexity. So it's a very complex area that you're dealing with. And sometimes law doesn't exactly match up. There might be some indeterminacy around it. What, what, what kind of pushback are you seeing? And what are the arguments that, that you find um, resonate with your uh, other board members? Well, I'm not going to discuss our internal discussions um, here necessarily, but the discussions um, that I've seen in terms of a reaction to the board's work, um, particularly in the U.S., are often, I think, as Mina touched on, kind of a, a um, reluctance about human rights law. Um, and, and I think part of it is just um, a lack of... Um, of, of background on what international human rights law is and how it works. Um, and um, I'm actually working on an article now comparing the First Amendment to human rights law to try to, to bridge those gaps so people can see um, rather than uh, make a judgment um, from a position of not understanding human rights law and kind of being reluctant about it. Um, there are also scholars, as, as you've mentioned, who have voiced concerns that there isn't enough guidance in human rights law. And uh, really in, in the work that I'm doing in terms of accumulating um, all the, you know, the work that you've done, that the Human Rights Committee has done, there's just an enormous corpus of, of information. And it's just not presented in a very human rights way, or sorry, research friendly way on the UN website, quite frankly. And it takes kind of gathering it all together to be able um, to digest it. So I think that's part of um, the problem with understanding human rights law as a, as a, um, as a, as a matrix, as a metrics. And also, I think that um, all of these cases, even with the application of human rights law, require judgment, right? Where's that line on incitement? Um, where is that line on what's improperly vague? Um, even with a lot of guidance, it requires judgment. And when we have people from all over the world with different expertise, different experiences in their lives, different concerns, um, it, it takes time to evaluate that. Um, but that doesn't mean that human rights uh, isn't working. I think it is still the guidepost that, that gets us to the final uh, decisions. Great, thanks for that. And you know, by the way, the lowest hanging fruit in international human rights research is complaining about the OHCHR website. So I just want to acknowledge that, that issue. So I, I want to take us sort of from this, this kind of opening of expectations and surprises. This has been really great to hear sort of the path that, that you've all taken. Um, obviously, you know, the, the board is doing some really interesting work, I think, around content moderation in particular. Like how do the rules actually apply to specific kinds of content? You know, whether it's you know, insult and bullying or it's incitement or, or something else. But of course, and this is a, a kind of a reflection on the recommendations that the board has uh, proposed over the last uh, several months. The, the ecosystem for information and rights online goes beyond decisions about what stays up and what comes down. And the board has made some really interesting recommendations to Facebook. And, and I just wanted to highlight a few of the recommendations from the, from the Trump uh, deplatforming case. Um, where the, the board recommended, for example, more resources to, to assess the risks of particular content. Um, you made a recommendation or the board made a recommendation that Facebook should review its contribution to the narrative 
of electoral fraud um, in the United States, focusing on, and the quote here is design and policy choices. And, you, and the board also made a recommendation that Facebook develop and publish policy that, um, uh, that governs Facebook's responses to crises. So you're obviously moving into this space that is well beyond uh, sort of the strict, this content should come up and this content should stay down or this account uh, should be uh, suspended or not. And I think that's very interesting. And I wanted to hear from you what you expect from Facebook um, in terms of its responses to your recommendations and whether you think, and it's very early, I, I mean, I want to acknowledge that, that the Trump case is actually a, a recent decision of the oversight board. So you're probably still in the place of waiting to hear what Facebook says, but what do you expect Facebook to do in response? And, um, and, and have, you, have you felt that their reaction so far has been positive? Maybe start with you, Nigat. Um, yeah, so uh, David, I guess, uh, first of all, I think the nature of, um, you know, cases that we have been looking into, uh, uh, definitely it's, a com it's, it's complex. Uh, and, uh, and I think it also says a lot, the, 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 the combination of board members says a lot about the diversity and, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, like diverse sort of opinions we have during our deliberations. Uh, but I would say that I think that's also the beauty where, you know, like uh, we managed to tell each other that, that there is a world beyond the developed world and the First Amendment. And, you know, we really need to look into the other context and the other uh, other jurisdictions and the laws that, you know, like people are not just fighting against the tech giants policies, but also their local laws that are very, very problematic. So, you know, they have like repressive regimes and then repressive policies by the tech giants. So I just wanted to say uh, that around the complex nature of, uh, you know, the decisions that we make, but at the same time, I guess, um, board uh, in its decisions uh, have made it clear, you know, they are binding decisions, but then we are, you, you know, giving recommendations to the company that these are the gaps that they can look into. And, and then, you know, to hold the company accountable, we'll be very transparent in our annual report that what they have done and what they haven't done so far. So I think uh, that's, that's all I want to say in terms of recommendations, but those recommendations come from you know like a di comes from a diverse op opinion of the panel members and those opinions are not coming from just one jurisdiction from several jurisdictions and i think that's what something makes it sometimes complex but also sometimes you know like uh, to me it's very satisfying that uh, we also have like power in those panel discussions where we can say hold us act you know there is something in my jurisdiction so you really need to keep that in mind while making a decision for something very important so I, I wanna stick with you here, Niga, because this is a really interesting point that you're making about local law and the pressures that local law or national law can impose on users, on the platform. And um, I, I mean, I'll hop back to the, to the bigger question uh, with Mina in a second, but, but before I move on to that, do you think, so I'm in a way asking you to step outside of the oversight board function in a way, it, but but not because there is this recommendation aspect to it. What what do you think? Just maybe even thinking about Pakistan and the distance of the company from the lived experience of people in Pakistan, particularly online. What what are the things that you want to see so that the company is more capable of observing human rights? I mean, is it resources? Is it better context? Is it more of a presence in the leadership of Facebook? What what are those things um, to your mind? I think David, it's bits and pieces, all of these things, you know, I think it's a lack of uh, willingness when it comes to these jurisdictions, uh, because as Mina said, it's a powerful, rich company. It's not that they don't have resources. It's not that they, can, they cannot look into these jurisdictions uh, because COVID is here. It's, I think it's the willingness and the will within the company that needs to change. And if I like, 
removing the hat of board and a digital rights activist from Pakistan, I think some of the things that we have addressed in some of our decisions are also looking into the language, right? So regional languages is something that, you know, we have been pushing the company to look into not just Facebook, I, I would say like other companies also, but also at the same time, when it comes to local laws, speak to the users also. What they do, basically, they speak to the governments. And if the companies can find a space to speak to the governments, why they cannot you know, speak to the users or civil society based in these jurisdiction? I mean, wh what is hard in here? So I think these are the things that the companies really, especially Facebook, really need to look into. Uh, but I would also say, like, uh, if, if I put my board hat i think these are also the things we can also you know like recommend in our decision and then hold the company accountable at the bigger level yeah that's that's so interesting so let me sort of pop back to that point and ask mina um mina i mean you started off by saying you know you have uh like maybe to put it diplomatically um you know you have some doubts about about the company and um some concerns about it and now we're seeing the oversight board stepping into some of those spaces where I think your concern seems, um, you know, relevant. Um, what? How do you feel so far about the conversation that the board is having with Facebook? Obviously, it's not sort of an individual having a conversation with a policy person at the company. But are are you sensing that the board is able to move into this space and positively influence? these kind of bigger questions about the environment in which content decisions are made? That's a great question. I think, I think, I think for, for me that the issue around, around um, the issue around the company is a question of power. How do we, how do those people who are powerless address and hold accountable those who have power? And so I think it's a natural progression. And I believe human rights, and I, maybe it's a very different approach than traditional human rights work, but I believe human rights, the work of human rights is to constantly expand the boundaries to hold accountable those who are in power, whether they're in government, the states, or they're in corporates, wherever they are. That's or whether they're in the house in the house, which is why, which is why domestic violence and, and, and women's human rights issues are important. How do we hold those who are in power accountable? So whichever way it is, whether it's through the, the content moderation or keep pushing and saying, you got to put more resources into content moderation. So it's not all automation. And remember, and remember as well that as we go through this debate is that the, that Facebook is, is registered and incorporated in the United States of America, but 85% of its users are outside North America. So how does it become, so it is actually more, it's, so it's got to figure out this, is it's either going to be a US based US based company that's doing international work international uh, clients or it's going to be an international company and held to international law so i suppose all those things are going to are going to happen i think and i and when you hear us when you hear the board talking about about uh, uh, the the uh, the, well, the, third, the third thing the, the third recommendation about design it's a question of us not, we would like to understand how those algorithms work. We just, you know, you don't know how to say it. How do they work? Because they may help us in our work because we, we, as we're doing oversight over the content, how, how do we know how these algorithms work in, and which way? And then of course, it's also the question about whether Facebook has got algorithms that perpetuate division and stress and incitement within there, which we don't know. So we ask the question, are there any, is anything inside the company that you're doing that is driving this traffic towards that, that then leads to all the, con the crises and, and issues that are being raised against Facebook. So as a question on discovery, how do we move this process forward? And, and how do we have much more transparency within the company? So everybody who's a user and not outside can actually understand where the company is going. So, and those are very legitimate human rights concerns, David. They're not, they may not be within, not seen as traditional, but they're very legitimate human rights concerns. Yeah, and let me just ask you to follow up on the, the question of automation and AI. Those are very, I mean, those are complex questions um, and they're complex for non-technologists and for technologists themselves. So, I mean, do you, do you feel that you're getting, when you're asking questions about, about algorithmic recommendations or about what gets surfaced or as is really relevant in the context of incitement, the reach, the audience that is, attracted to and get and sees particular content like how that all works are you are you finding that you're getting um explanation from the company to help you make those kinds of context decisions 
I, I think those those issues are still ongoing. It's still a work in progress. We haven't yet come to a point where we we know exactly what's been given, what's not been given. That process is ongoing with the staff that are yeah. looking at it. So I can't I can't really answer the question. But I think that when we come to the year end report, you probably will see you will see um, you will see a response to that question. What has the company said? What have what's happened since then? Has it helped us? And we'll see whether that happens. But right now it's, it's yeah. too early in the process to do that. Great, thanks. So. Taking this issue, Evelyn, um, Evelyn, I wanna ask you, so still sticking with this, this broader kind of approach that we see in the recommendations. I mean, it does seem that there's a kind of bifurcation. The decisions are very much, um, you know, kind of rooted in the rules, the bylaws, the charter of, uh, of, the, of the board. And then the recommendations, which are permitted, of course, under the bylaws, allow you a little bit more space to, um, to expand so that you have better understanding of how this is all working in this whole ecosystem of, of, um, of content moderation and of, and of sort of content sharing and so forth. What, what is the argument or how do you see these issues, particularly maybe the example of automation is a good one. How do you see automation as a human rights issue? Like what, what, is, the, what is the argument in a way that, that the board, because of its remit, should be paying attention to issues like automation, even when you know automation might not deal with a particular kind of content or a particular post, but it's a broader question. What's what's the argument for that being um, within the human rights law framework? Uh, yeah, sure. I think um, the argument was was made in one of our opinions recently that um, that analysis of of design of automation. Um, is actually extremely relevant to the board's um, um, human rights law analysis in terms of, you know, we assess what Facebook is doing under the legality test, whether its rules are vague or not, whether they're imposing a restriction for a legitimate public interest objective. And then we look at necessity. And part of necessity is whether um, Facebook is using the least intrusive means um, to deal with a legitimate objective, to achieve a legitimate objective when it, when it removes speech. Um, and the first step in that analysis of whether a, a speech removal is the least intrusive means is indeed, how is it designed? What is it doing that itself in its architecture that maybe is causing the problem or exacerbating the problem? And we explained we need to know that information in order to assess if a removal or other punishment is, um, is the least intrusive means to achieve an objective. Um, just hearkening back to um, State Department days when we used to look at that lens for state action, for governmental action, we often um, uh, took the position it was inappropriate for governments to resort to sensorial methods when they weren't doing anything in their own uh, governance design to address issues of, for example, intolerance, violence, et cetera. Um, but they immediately resorted to, to censoring before looking and seeing what they could do um, to deal with these issues. So it's, it's, it's an analogy um, from, from that time and, um, and, uh, and that's how the board has, has, has phrased it in a recent opinion. That's great. Thanks, Evelyn. I, I think that's really a, a nice articulation of, uh, of sort of the broader framework of human rights and how it, how it plays out here. Let me ask, sort of move us slightly into a different direction. I want to emphasize anybody who is who is listening, who's watching this panel, please feel free to uh, submit a question. However, we submit questions. I can't really explain how that works, but we will get the question, I promise. So if you have a question, please do submit it so it can be part of our conversation. Um, I want to go to... Um, to an issue of sort of taking the oversight board experience. And we may come back to some specifics about the, about the board, but I wanna ask you, ask you all sort of two separate questions. Um, but let me start with the first one, which is more specific to the oversight board. And that is the, um, the nature of the interaction with Facebook when you request information. So you, you've done this a, a few times, I think. You've, you've asked for information and sometimes Facebook, uh, the company, will say no. We can't. We can't submit that kind of uh, that kind of information, or they'll make the argument that it's not relevant to your decision. Um, how is that? How has that worked out? I mean, is there any is there any sense that that you have that 
Facebook, given the fact that this is self-regulatory, there's no outside court that's going to enforce any judgment. The, the whole system is designed on kind of this, this good faith process and commitment that the company has made and to a certain extent. Is there a sense that you would like to, the company um, to say more when you ask for um, information? Are you generally pretty um, uh, satisfied with the level of information, the kind of information that you're getting from the company to help you make the decisions? I realize it's kind of a, a sharp question in a certain way, but you know, I think the tenor of, of your discussion so far has suggested that the board and you in particular, you know, are eager to push the company to, to provide as much information so that you can make uh, you know, accurate, uh, accurate calls on these things. I don't know if anybody wants to, to jump in to answer that, that question first. Evelyn is our professor, so she's good at this. So she can start us off. Mina, thanks for volunteering me. <laughs> um, so, so I would say, you know, looking back at, at all our decisions, we do um, make clear in our opinions when we are um, when Facebook has not answered uh, the questions, and we yeah. try to be transparent about that. That we asked for certain information, and that they would not provide it or said it was irrelevant, um, et cetera. So, hopefully, at least that transparency with the public um, puts some pressure on Facebook to keep that um, information um, coming. Um, hopefully, in the future. And we will certainly be issuing a um, transparency report in which we will discuss these issues um, uh, more um, uh, in depth. And, um, you know, in addition, we have an um, implementation working team that is really looking at Facebook to see when it's implementing and how it's doing its work. Um, and, and that too will be in the transparency report. So, you know, I think you've hit on an important issue, the, the um, fact that Facebook does not often um, or always answer our questions, um, but that we are trying to be as transparent about that as, as possible and, and make sure the public knows when that happens um, and, and we'll be issuing more um, formal views on that in a transparency report. Great. That's if great I mean, to hear. Yes, can please, I add on just a little bit. I, I, I think the, the beauty of this experiment is that, is that the reputation of Facebook is, is is, a, is, is a, on a risk in terms of how it responds to the board and how it responds to us. And our reputation as board members is at risk depending on how we work and how we don't decide. And so it's kind of nice that even though there's no court that is gonna make a decision beyond us, there's there are all these reputational risks that we are both in, involved in, which I think helps helps us and hopefully helps Facebook you know, become better at what it's doing. Because I, I see part of this, the process of us is, is us limiting and reducing Facebook's power, at least in content moderation. And then in some uh, other aspects that affect content moderation, you can't, you really can't talk about content moderation or talk about algorithms and how, and how traffic is driven and how ads up. You really can't. At some point you'll have to get there. So, so I, so I, I, I think we are getting there. It's again, it's, it's, it's early days. Uh, we will see how it goes in the next five, seven years and see whether it's a useful experiment or not. But it, it's just been, it's good in that sense because all of us, at least I know members of the board who are, are really, really careful about our reputations. We don't want to go in and be, can be swallowed in by this corporate uh, giant and then we become, we're told this has happened to us. So we're all nervous about that. But on the other hand, so we want to do a good job, but you don't want to be taken for, for a fig leaf. We don't want to be the fig leaves for this company. No, and so that's it's an interesting place where you're at. Yeah, right. That's that's really interesting. And um, I so you know we're we're friends. We can pretend that like nobody's listening to us for for a moment. Um, and I'll tell you what the question is in my mind, and and you could tell me how or whether you want to answer it, um, because it's a it's a kind of abstract question in a way. You know, your reputations matter. Um, you're all, and I don't think any of you have anything to worry about there. You're all known as independent minded human rights defenders and, and scholars. Is there something that you can imagine? And if it, it doesn't have to be specific, but is there a category of Facebook um, response or category of Facebook behavior that would really give you pause about staying on the board? 
right? Because you, you know, what you've described, and this is what, you know, we started with your expectations and things that were surprising. And I thought it was very interesting to hear that you're all, you all sort of joined this as an experiment to see if this self-regulatory model can work to restrain some of the, um, you know, some of the activities of a company that have a pretty massive and often deleterious uh, impact on human rights, a negative impact on human rights. Are there, is there something where you'd say, you know what, I think, I think I've, I'm going to move on to, to my other uh, activities, devote more time to other things and leave the board. Is there some, is there like a category? I mean, it wouldn't be specific to uh, a, a case, but is there something that would, would give you pause or that you think about? I imagine you thought about that when deciding to join the board too. Anybody want to try to answer that question? You know, sometimes they, they, say, they say, David, that you, 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 you'll know it when you see it, you know, but you know, you'll know it when you see it. It's kind of hard to, to explain what it would be, but it would be perhaps a, a, a decision by Facebook or even by the board, by the way, that is so egregiously uh, violating every the principles we have that it would make, you know, for, there were quite a few people who thought that the, that the Trump decision would, was existential for, for the board. And and you know what happened after that decision? We had three days of of high of news, and then it all filtered out. And then now Facebook has announced their decision. Two days of news is filtered out. So you know who knows what the issue will be that that is that's existential that makes you say, okay, that's it. I don't know. I mean, you'll know you'll see when you 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 will know it when you see it. I suppose is the best way I can say. It. Yeah, great. You got. It? I would also uh, say, David. I think it's too early to uh, you know like. Uh, say something about an experiment i mean that's i mean that at least that's how i you know decided to join the board uh, keeping in mind that how long it can take to you know see the results of the decisions that we will make in the you know uh, in the oversight board um so uh, so yeah i i I, I think for me, it, uh, and even before the panel, I, we were talking about, you know, the whole process. For me, it's like l l learning about so many things, you know, like the, the, you know, the police, the discriminatory policies of the, uh, the company that I have been talking about for almost a decade now. I mean, I learned so much you know, went into the gap around those policies, values that we discussed, even your reports, you know, the different aspects of re uh, the human rights framework that we discussed, and then contextualizing those. I mean, even when you were, you know, producing reports, we were also the ones from Pakistan, you know, submitting our, uh, you know, uh, uh, documents to you and bringing conversation into the, I think that, I think, this is something that we are learning how to contextualize the international human rights framework and look beyond the, you know, like developed jurisdictions or let's say just, you know, like look beyond First Amendment, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's great. So let me let me um, step to a, a slightly different kind of question. And, um, you know, you've all been talking about this self-regulatory, we've been talking about the self-regulatory mechanism. But there's this separate conversation, actually conversations that are taking place worldwide, right? One question uh, sort of focuses on regulation. And, you know, we see like very active discussions about this, whether we're talking about Brussels or Washington or Delhi or Islamabad, I mean, everywhere, Nairobi, everywhere, the discussion is around what regulation should be imposed in order to restrain or constrain Facebook and the other large platforms. Meanwhile, there's a separate conversation about other forms of oversight, right? Somewhere in between the self-regulatory model and the cross-industry model. And I wonder if, like with these conversations taking place, whether there are things that you're taking away from the oversight board that, um, that, that help you understand where it can fit in in these other conversations. So, Maybe to ask it in a in a more specific way, and Evelyn, I'll I'll start with you um, to ask you this question: Are there are there lessons that you're taking away from the oversight board that could apply to cross industry oversight? Things like you know Article 19's social media council idea, um, or or to other kinds of ideas that draw from the example of press councils around the world. Are are there things that you're learning 
that you think would be applicable to that space? And maybe even another way to put it is, is there, is there anything about this self-regulatory model that might actually interfere with those kinds of processes? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a really interesting um, question. And I guess um, if I, you know, we're working on developing social media councils um, today, some lessons that I might apply would be, um, it's useful if uh, the companies pledge in advance to respect human rights law and their content moderation and conduct an internal audit to try to align themselves before joining. Um, I think that that would be um, a very helpful uh, launching pad for a social media council to have the companies that sign up um, make the pledge and make an attempt to align ahead of time. Um, in terms of um, uh, lessons for maybe broader regulation um, uh, like this, I mean, I still see things through the lens of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So, you know, we're we're, uh, you know, the second pillar of the company trying to respect human rights and creating a grievance mechanism. But the first pillar of the UN guiding principles is states uh, regulating to uh, protect uh, people, individuals from harms by other third parties, right? So that space for regulation is maintained in the UN um, guiding principles. Um, and I guess the, the lesson I would draw from um, serving on the board is that I think a useful space for regulation is with respect to automated techniques, algorithms, um, um, at, at the very least more transparency about how companies collect personal data and monetize it and then deploy it. Um, I think that is a space very ripe for, for regulation. Um, when I see intermediary liability laws, however, that require you know 24 hour takedowns of, of, of violent violative content, that I think is a very um, dangerous space for regulation, especially when I see the amount of work we put into deciding if something is hate speech that should be removed or not, is incitement that should be removed or not. I, I think placing that 24 hour, 48 hour burden on, on, on companies is just gonna result in an overreach of um, incentives to, to take down too much. So I guess those are my kind of initial lessons from a year on the board. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Mina, can I ask you uh, uh, this question as well? I mean, when you, in your initial response to, to my first question, you, you identified regulation as something that you think should, um, should be taking place. Of course, in, in Kenya, there have been forms of regulation. They tend to not be the most, um, say, uh, infused with human rights principles all the time. Um, but there is a real demand uh, in Kenya as and elsewhere as elsewhere for real transparency. Do you, do you see a kind of a role for the oversight board in in promoting good regulation? Is is this something that you're seeing develop as part of the conversation? You know, certainly the conversation outside of the U.S. and Europe. Are you seeing the conversation move in a helpful direction, at least in part because of what the oversight board is doing? I think it's a bit early. It's a bit early to say that. I, th I think people are watching, people are reading, people are trying to figure out what, what this animal called oversight board is really about. Is it a useful approach to, is it a useful approach to try and, and, and emulate and spread across parts of the world? Um, I think the, uh, the overreach is, is the worrying thing about regulation always is overreach, but then you, the, the other side of it is no regulation and we have a mess. So you, you've got to find that happy balance that exists. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, I think it's, it's uh, we, where I come from, I worry about, about overreach by the state, you know, and then when I see the US, I worry about over, you know, over, there's too much space without any, any regulation. So how you, that's the balance. So I, I think, just looking at it, I think, you know, social media is, is important and is going to grow. So we have got to find ways in which we, we have to grow with it in terms of regulation, whether it's a, how do you do this human rights? I suppose if you ask me what is the one thing I would, I would advise any, any people coming, anybody coming together is that they would have to read all of David Kay's reports on, on, yeah. uh, on, on uh, so social media and, and freedom of expression and try and implement them and use that as a guideline, even beyond others. But I think what, what Evelyn said as well is very important. We've also got to look at surveillance, the, the surveillance capitalism that exists. That's a fundamental. I think it, if we don't touch surveillance cap, cap, capitalism, we're not touching much more. You know, So it's, it's the center of it all and it's got to be addressed. 
That I mean, that's really interesting because of course, um, sort of the business model of the companies is not squarely within the oversight board's remit. Although again, looking back at, at some of the recommendations, um, you're clearly uh, thinking in that space. So I, that's, that's really interesting. I, I wanna ask um, Nigat a question that is, is a little bit different from, from this one around regulation, although you're welcome to answer that one too. But I, I wanna ask you, um, so we probably, I'm, I'm assuming we have quite a number of people uh, in the, on the panel who are, who are watching the panel or listening, who are interested in, you know, how do they influence the, the work of the oversight board and the board, you know, obviously in, um, I mean, in the context of the Trump, Trump case, there were something like 9,000 comments that were submitted. Um, what, what are the ways in which advocates can be most helpful in, um, in working with or communicating with or providing their advocacy to the oversight board? Are you finding that there are certain kinds of um, techniques or substantive issues that outside advocates and scholars might be bringing to the board that are particularly helpful? Um, yeah, so David, I would like to respond to your regulation question and, and, and yeah. also um, as a digital rights activist, you know, not as a board member. I think uh, uh, lots of governments are coming up with the uh, regulations um, uh, around regulating content internet in, in their own jurisdictions and, and pushing these companies to follow what they you know what they are making in terms of local laws and uh when it comes to board in our charter our scope is that you know uh local laws will supersede you know like our decision so you see you we can we cannot really you know uh influence what the local laws say or cannot really go into that space at least for now and uh and i think that's where i see the role of you know uh different mechanisms, different civil society organization and tech companies, as Evelyn said that, you know, make a pledge, you know, what exactly they will, they will be going to do when it comes to the governments where they have economic interest, where they have political, you know, like influence, like there, there is a political influence that, you know, can be used uh, with the company, especially in jurisdictions where there is a fear of, you know, blatant uh, censorship and blocking of these platforms. So I really, think that platforms, tech giants, not just Facebook, all of them really need to think through how they are going to respond to these regulation regime that is uh, coming up uh, and uh, it's being discussed in, in different jurisdictions. I can say in Pakistan and in India, that is the hot, hot debate at the moment. Uh, but to your uh, second question, which I forgot, uh, if you can- Well, actually, before before we get to the second question, then let, let, me, let me follow up with this point that you're making because I think you're making a really important one. And you know, earlier you, you also talked about local law. So local law regulation, I mean, we might, when we say regulation, it might give, give the sense that, oh, it's all within this rule of law framework and it's just about providing democratic accountability for the companies, which would be great. But you're also talking about, you know, the real kind of pressure that local law that governments are putting and not just through law, but through extra legal, mechanisms which you know as well as anybody so given that like what what do you see as the space for the oversight board to actually improve the way the companies deal with those legal pressures from governments so you know it's it's one of those spaces that i think the company itself says that's outside your remit and yet you know as we see in india for example over the last couple of months you know, demands from governments are extremely consequential for public debate. And it puts the company in a position of, well, how do we respond? So how do you, how do you see the oversight board in this kind of complex dynamic between the state, the individual and the, the company? So David, I guess uh, we, uh, we really shouldn't expect everything from the oversight board to respond like the company companies have lots of issues and and i think oversight board uh, has been established to address content moderation when it comes to states and local laws i think companies also really need to figure out you know like how they are going to respond because they have an obligation under the 
you know, uh, international law as well. Uh, oversight board is giving, you know, uh, besides the binding decisions uh, that they are making, they are giving recommendations uh, in the policy guidelines. Uh, and I think that's something that advocates and civil society organization really need to look into the nitty gritty of the decisions that we are making because we are putting a lot of labor into writing those decisions and and then looking into different aspects of the international human rights framework so i'm not sure if i have responded to your question but 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 at least that's how i see this well i know you have absolutely responded to it i guess you know it, it one way of thinking about local law and and governmental pressure is also as a form of content moderation, right? And, and the companies have a couple of different responses to that. I mean, one response that, that we've seen in some places is the, the company will essentially integrate into their terms of service and their rules, the, uh, the local law, so that it looks like the company is actually doing its own kind of self-governance, but in fact, it's implementing government policy. And, um, I'm not sure if there's a question that follows from this, although Mina, you raised regulation earlier. I wonder if you can imagine, you know, a space where you're actually having influence, um, uh, sort of assessing that dynamic itself. That is one of the hardest things, David, that, that, that I suppose not even for us, not for the oversight board, but I suppose what goes on for everybody who's pushing for, for human rights and freedom of expression across, across the world. You know, how do, how do you, how does a company deal with a, a government, an authority that is demanding that anything that's, that is critical of government be pulled out and how do you deal with it? And, and does the oversight board, does the work of the oversight board influence, have any influence at all? You know, you would hope so. You would hope that activists will be citing and say, look, let's use the oversight board as our moderator as opposed to using government uh, operations and 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 you know and 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 sometimes the sometimes the companies succumb we've seen that happening in in india as you say and sometimes in turkey where the companies are are succumbing to the to the authorities so i you know i think i think this this battle this uh, struggle this contestation between the state authoritarian states and and uh, and freedom of expression writ large not even just not just on the platforms will continue and it's been going on for years even in the before social media with the mainstream media when governments would order newspapers and and radio to say certain things so i suppose this is so this is where the the, the struggle will you know the the conversation continues i don't think it's any different from that and it's and what is painful is when the social media companies just um, roll over and accept and then and there's no discussion there's no transparency sometimes it's even good for them to say look we have been asked by the government of, of the united states to drop all these things it's much better if they say that and then people can have their own debate it may help move that discussion forward that's great so um we, we've only got two minutes left and then i think we just go dark and i think that just happens like automatically mid-sentence so um so I want to conclude with the, the question, the last question that I was asking Nigat, and it's really just a straightforward question as to what kind of advocacy, what kind of input, may not even be advocacy, but what kind of input would be most useful to you as board members moving forward? I mean, you do have this, there's a sense, you're not a court, but you have some of the bells and whistles of, of a court in the sense that you you have an interaction with the board, with, uh, you know, other uh, panelists, you have interaction with the company, with individuals who make submissions. What, what, should, um, what should advocates be thinking? And you've only got like, you know, 20 seconds to, to give a, like, here's what we need from civil society in, in, our in, in their input. I know Evelyn, if you wanna start with that. Sure, I mean, I would, I would say, please participate in the public uh, comments process for each decision uh, that, that, that we face. It's hugely helpful um, to be able to see what a range of, of experts and individuals are thinking. And people now know and are familiar with our, our template, how we write our opinions. So plugging into those issues that you know we will have to decide uh, for a particular case uh, based on how we write the opinions, how we evaluate the human rights aspects is great. And on a more um, maybe a detailed scale, I would say for civil society actors that really follow these issues, I think you really need to um, make room in your point of contacts portfolio. 
right, mm -hmm. um, to, to handle this because it's, it's kind of a growing part of the portfolio that can, you know, overwhelm one person. So I would say be thinking um, strategically about how to be a consistent participator in our public comments process. Thanks, Evelyn. Uh, Nigat, Mina, just like a quick word before we go dark here. Yeah, actually what Evelyn said, but we need more contribution from Global South from our own jurisdictions. Great, thanks, and Mina. I have nothing more and not, nothing further to add. I think Nigata said it all. We just need much more people, more people from the Global South participating, raising questions, being as critical of us as, as we expect. I think the more criticism we have, the better it is for the board, to be honest. That, that's a fantastic uh, point to, to end on here. Evelyn, Nigat, Mina, you know, I hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I hope our audience has as well. It's great to see you next time in person. I, I really hope and stay well, stay healthy. And to everybody who's watching, thanks so much. Thanks for your questions as well, which had such a, an impact here. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, David. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.